Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger, a mystic for any age. Dr. Gabriel Cousins pursued spiritual liberation through holistic medicine and three great spiritual traditions, Torah, Jewish mysticism, Eastern yogic way of life, and Native American Sundance traditions, and Dr. Cousins will be with us in just a few minutes. So stay tuned for an amazing show today. I want to thank the sponsors for this show, Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do beautiful energy work out into the world. And if you're interested in becoming a facilitator or attending one of their online classes, anywhere in the world, go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R.com, as well as access consciousness.com. Dare to Dream podcast has been on air for over 13 years and has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards and a Webby Award. We are consistently ranked in the top 100 best podcasts in all of the USA in and on Apple Podcasts as well as in other countries. Debbie Dashinger is a certified coach whose expertise is visibility in media. She coaches people to write a page turner book, takes their book to a guaranteed international bestseller, and pulls back the curtain so her clients have the system to be interviewed on media and podcast and get massive results, such as how to find and use media exposure to locate your tribe, fill workshops, sell books, and gain positive exposure. You can connect with Debbie as well as get your free templates and tools so you can start to get booked on media at debbie-dashinger.com. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com. Question, do you wanna know more about Jewish mysticism, Eastern yogic way of life and Native American Sundance traditions and more. My guest is Gabriel Cousins, MD, who is considered one of the world's leading experts and proponents of raw live plant source nutrition. Dr. Cousins pioneered a way to cure diabetes in just 21 days. Dr. Cousins is a four-year Native American sun dancer, an eagle dancer, and an 11-year spirit dancer. Adopted by the Lakota Sioux Hornship Clan, he was appointed head of the Yellow Horse Clan. Beginning in 2008, Dr. Cousins began developing diabetes prevention and organic farms programs supported with micro-business loans in 26 different countries. Dr. Cousins is the author of 13 books. He is a holistic physician, psychiatrist, family therapist, rabbi, yogi, spiritual mystic, and vital at any age advocate. He's a physician of the soul. And if you'd like to learn more, go to drcousins.com. That's Dr. C O U S E N S.com, as well as treeoflife.mn.co. And I welcome Dr. Gabriel Cousins to Dare to Dream. It's so great to have you here. Debbie, it's great. I uh, I love the title, Dare to Dream. So many people are afraid to dream. So wonderful. I love it. Yeah, so, me too. And I not like just to dare to dream, but to create the dreams, right? Well, you chose it. I uh, hope you would like it. Yeah, right, right, exactly. That's what it means. So it's beautiful. So I'd like to start with the prayer, merging the heavens and the earth. Yes. And the heart and the mind, because they're metaphors, okay? Mm -hmm. So here it goes. L'shem yakub k'dusha b'rihu u'shinute b'i'u o'r'imu l'ayha k'shinute b'ravke y'udash l'mashem k'zreel k'olam amen. So just feel the merging of the heart and mind. Feel that, what we call chokmah halev, wisdom of the heart. Okay, nice. Nice. What language okay. was that? So, there were times when that sounded like that was Hebrew, and there were times it sounded like it you were speaking Hebrew. an Indian language. It was Hebrew. 
hmm. Hebrew. Just my own accent, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. Uh, so this is great because uh, I want to hearken some into that, but I, I love what you're about and I love the quest and the energy that you have and you bring to your work continued and to your life. So let's just start with the fact, here you are, this good looking guy, and let's just tell people your age because I don't believe anybody would believe it. Let's start there. So my chronological age is 77, okay? Um, and comparatively speaking, I'm getting younger. Mm -hmm. And I mean that seriously. So yeah. when I was captain of an Amherst College football team, inducted into the National Football Hall of Fame, 21 years old, I could do 70 push-ups and uh, seven pull-ups, 500 sit-ups and so forth. Now at 77, I regularly do a thousand push-ups three times a week, 80 pull-ups. I can hit, I've hit a hundred, but I do 80. And uh, I couldn't even touch my toes as a football player. I could get about six inches above the ground. Now I put my hands on the ground. Uh, I couldn't cross my legs. Now I sit in full lotus for you know, for hours. So what, what, what's the message here? There is a message is that according to our mental state and our spiritual state, we can actually get younger with age. I'm obviously younger, more flexible and stronger, literally, literally eight, 10 times more than when I was a very good athlete at the age of 20, 21. So it's a very positive viewpoint. It's like, Oh, my brain can get more flexible. My body can get more flexible because people tend to consolidate and get hard with age. Yeah, in their mind as well as their body, and so it's a it's an important message, a really important message. Will you and go a little deeper into that, for, Gabriel? For people who are listening and are thinking, I would like some of that, please. I'd like to look like him. I'd like to become more <laughs> flexible. I'd like to feel younger, act yeah. younger. I'd like to touch the floor and sit in a lotus position. So can you give us some specifics? What do you do physically and or nutritionally and certainly mind-wise to create all of that? Okay, something, ha I mean, I'll give you some of the, ma the math of it, but something happened uh, about 17, 18 years ago. Um, not that I wasn't doing things, but... I was in the middle of a eagle dance. So that's a Native American thing. Uh, and there were about 60, 70 sun dancers. Eagle dance is when you uh, are pierced to your chest uh, for all four days of the dance versus one or two hours. Okay. So you never leave the circle. Uh, at night, you just sleep on the ground. Mm -hmm. So on the third day of the dance, it was really hot and difficult for people. And everybody had left the field but me. And my Sundance chief said, get going, start really dancing. And then the drummer started going. And I just started dancing ecstatically. I just, I, even though I'm, I don't know much about Sundance, let me just explain it. You actually have hooks in your chest attached to a tree, okay? And it's like, I'm dancing ecstatically and something shifted as if I, Usually at four days, you don't eat or drink for four days. Mostly you get a little weaker. I'm getting stronger. What is going on? So there was a mental shift. And on the fourth day, uh, you're supposed to pull back and break. And I didn't just pull back and break, break meaning uh, the hooks out of your chest, okay? I didn't just pull back. I did a, well, people said I did a backflip, but I think I just did a somersault. But whatever it was, I had so much energy. So something shifted in my mental state, okay? And again, I, I was the only one really of 18 Eagle dancers to really never leave the circle. So, I mean, there's a few secrets. Like you take an enema before you do the Totally. These you know, I know about this practice you're talking about. 
I ask you these hooks, I mean, is it painful? You have metal, don't you, going through that's pulling. Is, is it painful? Well, Does it well, create scars? You can't, quite, quite the, can you see the scars there? I can. Can you see the scars there? Yeah. Right where my finger is. Yeah. Ooh. Okay, so what you have is that they, they cut two holes and they put a wood peg about the size of your finger. Through that, and you're putting those in and then they attach a rope to it. Two ropes, two places like that. For women, also do something, they do it on the shoulders. Okay. okay. They do it here. Uh, you don't want to be doing it on the breast. No, you don't want to be here. doing that here. So, and, and so it's, a, it's wood, two holes that they cut, okay? And then you put the wood in, again, about this thick, and then the rope is tied to it. And then you have two, one on each side. And then when you break, you pull back and then it just flips it open at the end after four days. Does that answer the question? Or? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you, when you're dancing ecstatically, you're not feeling a lot of pain. And for me, for four years, I was the only one to make it without food and water. Because you know, if you really need to do it, I'll give you something. But um, it's a mental state. And so there was a shift that took place. Now, so I, how do you get stronger each day instead of weaker? That's a mental shift. It's a spiritual shift. So that's what happened. Now I apply it to my life. So I regularly do yoga. How about six times a week? Okay. Mm -hmm. What kind I'm of yoga? yoga? I'm doing breathing, which we call pranayama. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's called tri yoga. Uh, my wife is a yoga teacher, and it's called tri yoga. And it's a flowing yoga, okay, rather than a static yoga, mm -hmm. so to speak. So you move from one position into another. It's always a flow, okay? Then I do pranayama, our breathing exercise. By the time most people are 70, They've lost 50% of their lung capacity. Well, that doesn't happen if you're doing breathing exercises. So what I'm saying is a certain intent. You got to work a little harder. You do the physical exercise. I mentioned the 1,000 push-ups, the 80 mm. pull-ups, sometimes 100, 100 sit-ups or 500 sit-ups, and a variety of other things that you do, that I do, that just keeps maintaining and expanding strength, flexibility, and endurance. It, it's, it just takes some effort, okay? It takes some intention. So there's no secret to this. Once you start doing it, it usually takes people about two years to get into a, a higher level of, of function, you know, where you're, you're sustaining it. So that's kind of what it is. I do a variety of things. I don't really do weights. Uh, uh, I I uh, work with these very like rubber bands and different things like that that they do it. But that's it. There's nothing spectacular about that. Now, what adds to it? I'm also on a 100% vegan or or plant-based diet, and I'm about 99% live food. Well, that does actually help. It helps with strength, uh, agility. A balance, because with age, also people tend to lose their balance. Yeah. Uh, you're a little on the young side, okay, in my world, okay? But when people get in their 70s and so forth, there's a tendency. So you want to always be working on your balance. So we have what we call, uh, different poses in yoga, focus on balance as well. Okay, I'm not going to go into different poses, but the, the point is you have balance is important. Okay. If you don't practice it, use it or lose it. This is really what it comes down to. So it takes some effort, it takes some intention, but there's also this thing about getting younger and stronger and more flexible and having more endurance with age. It's a mindset, is what I'm saying. As well as, yes, I'm working hard, I do my push ups, I do that. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Yeah, it's really inspiring, without a doubt. And I love your zest for life. and exploration. But I love it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. 
your latest book it's, is see, called, to me. Uh, yeah. Sorry, into, so sorry. We have a little bit of lapse going into the on. Nothing. Yeah, thank you, thank you for for <laughs> thank you yeah, technology and yeah. COVID. But your latest book, uh, Doctor Cousins, is called Into the Nothing: A Spiritual Autobiography, and it talks about you surrendering to the divine urge. I want to start there. What does a divine yeah. urge mean to you? So it's a very good question. No one's asked that question. I love it. Thank you. Manish so, Chana, Laila has We have the death urge. <laughs> okay. We have we have the death urge, we have the sexual urge, right? The divine urge is what I describe in my book is the primal urge of all creation. The primal reason why we're put here on this planet is to know God. So the divine urge, uh, we call it David Kut Herut or to uh, God merging and enlightenment are the driving forces of all humanity. Now, does that mean everybody knows that? No, that's not the case at all. But when you reach a certain point, that becomes the primal urge to return to God. So that's what I'm talking about when I say divine, urge for the divine, beyond sex, beyond death, anything. It's the most important reason we're here. And at a certain point in your evolution, you actually get it. So in my book, Into Nothing, I have a lot of poetry talking about it. Um, I have a lot of poems. But the divine urge is the driving force behind, behind spiritual life in which all the spiritual practices are no longer practicing. They're a way of life that keeps reinforcing you going beyond the mind and into the nothing. That's it. Now, I'll go a little further with that. Um, into the nothing is... Uh, is actually literal. So the Torah says you can't know God and live. Very profound. Most people don't really get it. But what it means is uh, you go from the nothing ein into kind of the something ein so into the something. Now, what I'm saying is the nothing part is where you disappear. There's no you. So you can't know God and live because there's no you there to be there. So we're born into I am this. I am a, you know, I'm a boy, I'm a girl, I'm whatever, I, you know, I'm, I'm a teacher. I'm okay. That's I am this. Then we have I-ness, which is pure awareness separate from any identification. And then the nothing is where the I-ness disappears to. So you could have a void, uh, some couple, uh, somebody, you never a couple, somebody, but there's a you in the void. This is prior to that. There, there's no you, there's no void, there's only the nothing. Uh, and, and, and actually, if you look at Genesis day one, it's primordial chaos. No form, no time or space. Yes, primarily okay. That's the nothing. And the nothing okay. actually no, is no the no thing. Of, is uh, that correct? People. The nothing meaning the place of all creation. That's right. And may I ask you yeah. when you I, I find that really creation. interesting when you say <clears throat> that's very really good. Good. The divine urge, you say, is for us to know God, the, the reason why we're here. And I'm curious because a lot of metaphysicians say we are all God and that we are God becoming a form in order for God to know itself. Is there a difference between God knowing itself through each of us as a form as opposed to us coming to have a life to know God? This is a very deep question you just asked. Okay, and there is a difference. See, if there's you kind of getting to God or I, I'm one, there's still an I that's one. This is prior to the oneness. Because I-ness uh, is still existing in I feel one with all. Does that make sense what I'm saying? 
100%. Here, there's no I to feel one. There's only that. So it's a it's a deeper state, actually, you know, where, where you stop existing as a separate I-ness. Then from the I-ness, then you move into I-ness, then you move to time, space, and energy, where you start to have form, and so forth. So this is prior to that. Very few people talk about this, but since this is my direct experience over the years, getting more and more into that, okay? That's how I came in, into the nothing. I actually, the title was initially dissolving into the nothing, but they thought that was just a little bit too heavy, but, but that's what we're talking about. Yeah, you totally. You disappear. I love that. I, I love that. I, I understand that intimately, actually. And do you receive guidance, spiritual guidance on a daily basis? And if so, what form does that take for you? Good, really good question. So there's a metaphor. I don't know if you can see the river behind me on the Russian River. Can you see the river? Yeah, my God, it's beautiful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we have the river of life, okay? And for me, God speak has spoken. When I was four years old, I can't tell you why, but I knew I needed to be a doctor. No one in my family had ever been doctors. Our family was some Bialystok. Uh, they were bakers and whatever, you know. And when I was eight, I began to have mystical experiences seeing uh, uh, people in white uh, mystics. And different mystical experiences happened over time, which kind of took me to this. But the next direct message is when I received Shakti powder, the waking of the Kundalini energy from Swami Muktananda, age 33, uh, 1975. And I went into the nothing for the really first time in my life. As I came out, a little voice rang out and said, you should learn to eat and live in a way that supports the Kundalini. I was very new at this, okay? Really pretty new. It's like, okay, I really need to understand the Kundalini. I need to understand the best diet. So for the next seven years, because I was in an ashram type setting, both in India and we were actually South Fallsburg, which is upstate New York, but also in, in LA as well. Um, I explored the question. And pretty much came up with my uh, book, you know, uh, my first book, Spiritual Nutrition in the Rainbow Diet, which was a 100% vegan plant-based food. And well, for me, 99% live food, but well, I said 80% for vegan. And that's the diet that best supports the good relief. Because meat, fish, chicken, and dairy are the energy of death. And one of my other uh, two things, my second one, Tony Prakashanana, would say, when you kill an animal, you create fear, misery, and pain. But when you eat it, you take that into you. And that blocks the flow of the divine energy. So I began, obviously, moving in that direction. I wasn't born uh, a vegan. Uh, that wasn't, I was outside of Chicago, Chicago stockyards in the 40s. Forget it. Who ever heard of a vegan? Okay. So what's that? Okay, so once we get past that, that message came out. Now, in 1983, I did a 40-day uh, fast. And, and at the end of that fast, uh, again, a little voice rang out and said, go to your roots. And let me ask, just for edification, so when you say a 40-day fast, do you mean water only? Do you mean as a breathitarian? Do you mean what did you intake or not? Uh, it was a juice fast. Mm -hmm. okay. I've done a 21 day water fast as well, but it was a juice fast, which is the kind of fasting we, we do because you have enough energy to do everything. Mm -hmm. okay? uh, so at the end, a little voice rang out. I was kind of leaving my body to tell you the truth, but a voice came out and said, no, it's not your time. Get back in your body and go to your roots. Fine. So I began studying uh, Judaism and all the... Uh, you know, the Kabbalah and, and, and my room. So that there's a little voice that 
gives that direction at particular times in your life. Now that's a little different than the question you asked. The question you asked is when you're meditating twice a day for an hour or so, okay, you're constantly getting input from the divine. You're constantly. But then there's the, let's say the sentences in capital letters, go to your roots, you know, learn to eat in a way it supports Kundalini. Does that make sense what I'm saying? So there are two levels of that. So um, we want to commune with the divine every day and we're getting messages and we're getting aligned with the river of life, which is right outside of me where I'm pointing to out there. Uh, and the key is to bring our will in alignment with the divine. Okay, which, which means normally for most people, the ego runs consciously. But as you evolve, consciousness runs ego. We need the ego. We, we, in India, we call ahamkara. What's the ego? It's, well, it's your physical body. I mean, if you didn't have your brain and you didn't have your body, how are you going to get around? How could we do the show? Right? Mm -hmm. So the ego is not inherently bad. It's when you identify with the ego, then that's when we have trouble. Okay? So ego is good, but it has to be aligned with consciousness or under consciousness. And then that consciousness is aligned with the river of life, which is the divine design of who we as unique in individuals are supposed to be, are meant to be. Most people, everyone's born original, most people die copies. The key is to be original again. And, and that's really what my book Into Nothing is about, is this path back to being an original. And it covers all the uh, uh, different things. You know, I, I, I say all I ever learned in life was from meditation, playing football, and sacred relationships. Now, you laugh about the football thing, but let me explain. My initial spiritual experiences were when I went beyond my limits. And it kind of, mm -hmm. not into the nothing, but really began having ecstatic experiences playing football. That may sound ridiculous, but that is really what was going on. Is yeah. I would go to these other planes beyond the zone that athletes talk about. Mm -hmm. You know, you're feeling really good. This is really mystical, uh, uh, really going beyond the body, uh, uh, deep experiences. So football was my first initiation into the mystical world. You know, that's so. not uh, far-fetched at all to me. I understand from the standpoint, I've done two Los Angeles marathons. Oh, okay, there you and go. And that was a deeply spiritual experience going way beyond anything I conceived I could possibly do. Yeah. Certainly the first year. And the second year, because I like to dream bigger, I decided to best my time. And so I set, a, I'm going to carve 30 minutes off of my finish time, which is pretty grand for 26.2 miles. And I used meditation, I used visualization, and of course I was training. Yeah. And not only did I carve off 30 minutes, I carved off over an hour. Wow. So when I finished and went through the finish line and saw the clock as I had in my visualizations, but I had taken a full hour off, that was, it blew everything out of the water to show me like, wow, just take, this is a minute example of what's possible. So then what yes. else is possible? That's beautiful. I love it because it's accessible to everyone. I mean, for me, it was football. You're doing the marathon, same principle. You're going beyond your perceived limitation. Yeah. So here you are. I love this. So you're, you're, opening yourself up to know God and you're getting these messages and you're exploring Judaism and the Kabbalah and the essence teachings. And then your path, and this is all in the book, folks, when you get right. the book, your path takes you to the native American tradition and you really brave. You've talked some about this, but you really brave some extreme spiritual rituals of initiation I don't know if you're allowed to talk about specifics yeah, outside of the Sundance, we, but we can. I would love you to and how it changed you and how you're even living here today to talk about it. So 
when in 1973, I had uh, another vision. And again, God speaks to us in, in capital letters sometimes. Uh, I was actually taking a, an S course, mm. the last one of Warner Earhart, okay? Yeah. And uh, I saw three figures. I saw Crazy Horse, Lakota mm. Sioux. I saw Abraham. And I saw Sai Baba of Shirdi. Not the current Sai Baba, but he left his body in 1980. Okay. So these figures are speaking to me. What, what, what's going on? I mean, they weren't in my, I mean, obviously they were in my conscience, but they weren't in my conscious consciousness. Okay. So <sighs> Crazy Horse is what motivated me to do the Sundays. Uh, I, we have past lives, and I, I, I'm sure your audience knows about that. But I uh, probably was the first Native American doctor. And he met when he was eight years old. He met Crazy Horse. Okay, so without getting into details, somehow Crazy Horse was somewhat of a mentor. But that was what encouraged me to do the Sunday. So it was I was inspired. I didn't. I didn't grow up thinking I was going to do Sunday. No, it just happened very quickly. And even when I I did the what we, what we uh, call the eagle dance, again, as you say, you as I explained, you're tied to the tree for four days, not just an hour or two. It was all spontaneous. So a lot of it is the illusion of spontaneous, but not really spontaneous, because it's all there. So I'm inspired by Crazy Horse. Then we look at Sai Baba of Shirdi. Uh, most people don't know that he was a God merge being, very unique. And actually I spent later, spent a lot of time in his, what we call Masjid. People couldn't figure out whether he was a Muslim or a, a, a Hindu, very unique guy. But once he actually materialized in front of me, you know, when I mean materialized, there was somebody else next to me who saw him also. And he actually gave me uh, what we call Shakti Pot energetic initiation. Knocked me over. It was like, what? Okay. I was walking with Swami Prakashan and we both saw him, but he, he focused on me. So there was actually a materialization of him. And why I report it, because somebody else saw it happen. Okay, so I made these, these are deep connections. Now, Abraham, Avery, boundary crosser, right? Uh, has been part of the story for me. But when I uh, went to Israel, I, and we, we actually uh, have, uh, we're, we're citizens of Israel, we're just citizens. I took an initiation of my own because they didn't have it. They call it Aliyah, but that's not an initiation. Stepping up, not an initiation. So I I went to the Negev Desert. Okay. And sometimes people can live for a day in the Negev without food and water and then they can die. Okay. So I was I found a little half cave and I was there, uh, stayed there for 72 hours without food and water experiencing. But at some time during the night, I had a little fire going because there's wild animals and stuff. Abraham appears and communicates into me uh, some of his qualities, like universal love, like the spiritual warriorship. Because he was a great spiritual warrior. Uh, his tent was open in all four directions. He and Sarah had a probably the first really healthy relationship of male, female being more equal. She was a prophetess. He was a prophet. You know, they, they're, that's very unique relationship. Very powerful for, for 3000 years ago, right? 2,700 years ago. So he also initiated. So I actually got initiated by, in these three great traditions, by actual of uh, uh, energetic beings who actually materialized. Now you can 
this stuff isn't imagination. This really does happen. You know, fortunately, they're witnesses. I also was initiated by Lakshmi. Uh, I don't know if you know who Lakshmi yes. is. Yes, Indian goddess, okay. absolutely. Yeah, the, the goddess and the consort of Rama. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I was just meditating in the forest in Petaluma. I was doing fire service. She materializes and literally merged with me, not just sexually, at, at every level. And so she activated the sacred feminine. Because we got three men, but we have the sacred feminine. And so there, there was seriously a transformation of Lakshmi initiating me and in, in the actual merging with me uh, in, into my being. So these figures do, they actually really do materialize. Again, fortunately, they're witnesses, so it's not like I'm crazy, right? You know, and so Lakshmi also initiated in, in, the, in the process, which was uh, very, very significant, activating the sacred feminine. Did so you come I, out with any different qualities after each of these mergings? Were you, were you able to speak differently or understand the matrix of things differently? What were you imbued with by virtue of that happening? So really each one gave a particular spiritual gift. So Lakshmi literally activated the sacred feminine. And uh, uh, without going too far into it, let's just say, uh, Men and women both have male female qualities. She activated uh, female qualities in me. Uh, you know, uh, literally. Okay, uh, that uh, that that was the result of that. Okay, uh, where you can feel the subtle uterus, uh, you can feel oxytocin from your nipples. I mean, real. I mean, very very direct stuff. Okay. That that was way beyond my uh, my imagination. You know, it's like what? But that's what I mean. Uh, so I bother surely the same thing, but more more the spiritual qualities. But at the same time, uh, let's say uh, he 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 was in God merging state. Uh, different than self-realization. Self-realization is the first step where you're really waking up. God merging was where, where you're in that sustained state all the time. Self-realization you get, there's a you and you're liberated, but there's a whole spectrum. And I explained that in the book, you know, and so in Prakashananda who acknowledged me, he and Mukhananda as liberated, he made the point, hey, you're just a beginner. So part of what I got is I'm always starting over. Now, it's like every time you get to a certain level, you're a beginner again. You're never done. It goes on and on. So Sai Baba Shri was more at the end of the line. So in Prakashana and Mukhtana are we're in the middle part of, of, of the spectrum. Okay. Same thing with Lakshmi. I've had other feminine initiations, you know, which were very real. And so that part of me isn't, it isn't like a, a, a you know, a certain being politically correct. It's not like that. It's reality. It's my experience of that active sacred feminine within me, even on a physical level. Uh, I'll just share this, which is kind of funny. So. Mm -hmm. I think it's funny. So just a few weeks ago, I, I had blood tests done. So my testosterone is above the outer range, but also so is my estrogen. Now, that's not, I've never seen that before. That's a sacred feminine. So what I'm saying is they make a difference. I ask you though, it's my understanding, and of course you're a doctor, but it is my understanding that when men, as men age, uh, I believe it's past 40 years old, their estrogen does go up. Yeah, but not the testosterone. Usually the testosterone goes down, true. the estrogen goes up. Right. That's not what we're going on. I, 
you don't do a thousand push-ups two times a week with a low testosterone. Right. So both the testosterone and the estrogen are above normal, higher than normal. So that's what I'm trying to explain is that that's the actual initiation, mm. or I'm going to say infusion of the sacred feminine that actually changes your physiology. That's what I'm trying to say. Got and it. That's what I'm, I'm talking about, you, you're familiar with oxytocin? Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. So where, where, where do women experience it? Um, it's in sex. Yes. Well. Or well, birth, childbirth, I would imagine. Childbirth, but it's also, you experience it physically in, in, or in yes. nipples. Mm -hmm. Nipples are one place. So what I'm telling you seriously is that after this initiation, there was an increase in oxytocin. Mm. I could feel it physically. Mm. You see? What, now, what you see in men, if the testosterone goes down, the estrogen goes up, they get a, kind of a belly and they, they get kind of flabby. Mm -hmm. I mean, generally speaking, okay? Unless you're doing things. So that's not what's going on here. But the oxytocin has been activated. I can feel it in the places where women use Lucky it. you. <laughs> <laughs> That's and pretty I, rad. <laughs> and I, I'm not talking about, I don't need sex to do that. It's just, it's there. It's, it's active. there, present. Wow. Yum. So that's what I'm talking about. Hmm. That's, that's Lakshmi. Okay. Activating that energy. So is that making sense now? It's, it's a different reality. Yeah. Yeah. And what led to you feeling so passionate about curing diabetes? What got you interested? Diabetes. Yeah, in diabetes. What What was your interest in curing it? Well, in, in the in the early seventies, uh, I be we didn't have the word holistic physician. Mm. Didn't have that word. But as a psychiatrist. I saw that people's mental state was affected by their physical state. I saw that when people were hypoglycemic, they were, they were in balance really yes. on multiple levels and really also mm -hmm. in the chakras that are associated, okay, uh, with your physical, your endocrine system. So uh, to help people, I had to heal their hypoglycemia. So I had already been playing with it. Then, I just kind of got interested in diabetes, partly because a lot of Native Americans have diabetes, like maybe 90%. I, I don't want to say that, but have you ever heard of Dennis Banks? No, no, not He's at a all. a very famous Native American elder. Hmm. Uh, and Dennis was one of my clients and we became really good friends. He even let me do a sweat lot. I mean, he's a uh, senior, but I, he sat in my sweat, sweat lot. Because I, I lead the sweat lodges uh, on, uh, on the new moons. So um, then everywhere done it, we did a, a march across the United States for diabetes, for healing diabetes for Native Americans. He says everywhere he went, there's at least 90% of Native Americans have diabetes. So I was somewhat interested from the Native American position, also in India a huge percentage of Indians have diabetes. My two spiritual teachers had diabetes. So I had kind of an interest in it. Third is it's really simple to heal. If you apply the principle, they say it's incurable. I understand that. That's it's incurable if you don't know what you're doing. It's very curable if you know what you're doing. So you go on the, the life food diet 100%. You go on a low carbohydrate part of the life food diet, uh, but you still have to mix your diet to your constitution. Are all unique individuals? That's really important. Some people need more fat, uh, plant fat and protein than other people need less plant fat and protein. Everybody needs lower carbohydrate. So I naturally had an interest in doing this and, and that's how I came to it. I, I saw that it was tremendously affecting people's mental state, emotional state, physical state. Uh, and so that's how I got into healing type two diabetes. Okay. Uh, we also heal type one, uh, about 20% of 
in three weeks. 21% in three weeks. So it's all doable. And so that's kind of the, the message. So I just got into it because the different cultures I was living in, it was a big problem. So I needed to solve it that way. It's not like I ever had diabetes or have an abnormal blood sugar or anything like that. It's totally normal for this. the normal optimum of 70 to 85. Less than 100 is non-diabetic or non-pre-diabetic. Diabetic is a fasting blood sugar of 26 or less. So uh, normal blood sugar, like 85. So it's not me personally. It was like, how do I work with Native Americans? How do you help the people from India? Uh, it's more like that. And then it's a major epidemic in the United States because people eat too much. Yeah. They don't exercise. Yeah, without That's how exam. I got into it. That's all. Yeah. It's so interesting. Yeah, blood sugar levels are huge, so important for health. And I myself, when I was young, I'm very young, like around 21 years old, I was tested. I don't know how the doctor even figured out what was going on with me, but I had that terrible test where you have to drink yeah. something that's sort of like- Six hour uh, glucose tolerance test. That is correct. And it's like drinking Coca-Cola on crack. It's so sweet. Right. You have to fast, drink that, and then they take your blood sugar level literally every hour. And when I was done, you know, you already know where I'm headed with this. I definitely right. had extreme hypoglycemia. Um, I had never heard of it before. And then I had to contend with it for many years, this awareness, oh, okay, this is what's going on. This is why I'm tired. This is why I'm moody. This is why I have cravings. This is why. So I did a tremendous amount of research and it took years, you know, it was not overnight of refining. But, uh, you know, today I will tell you, and it's been decades, decades and decades, I'm completely healed. I have That's never had another true. blood sugar issue. So I feel very heartened to hear. And of course, let's be honest, I've done a yeah. tremendous amount of inner work and healing as well. Yeah. So the physical uh, also follows what is going on inside. I'm You're very definitely... heartened to hear you say that this is so as well for diabetes, that it can be yeah. those same principles to heal oneself. It's an extension of that, actually. Not that hypoglycemia goes always to diabetes, but you're a little, you're more on the heroic side. Okay. That's what I sense from you. And you have to love yourself enough to want to heal yourself. And part of the healing journey is getting people to love themselves enough to want to heal themselves and connect with their soul. So everyone in the three week program, I mean, literally 99% of the people feel, thank you for reconnecting to my soul. Because we have them meditating, we have them doing yoga, we have all these things going on. But the key is what you're just saying. You got to love yourself enough to heal yourself. And that is what, you, obviously you have the internal strength, but you also, you love yourself in a good way, not in an egoic way. Okay. But that's the power behind the healing. Right. And I feel strongly that pain is a great motivator. You know, pain is a great uh, red flag that says there's something really off yes. in your life and you can choose to live this way. And we already have an idea of how that's going to turn out because right. it's not fun right now. Or we can use this as a launching pad to completely alter things, even though we don't know what it's going to be like. We're not sure how we're going to get there. I, I feel like, you know, when I'm saying this euphemistically, because I want people who are listening to you. I hope they will feel inspired, whatever it is, fill in the blank they're experiencing that may be off or untoward in their life. That once we open up and say, I don't want to live like this anymore. This isn't good. This isn't acceptable. You know, the universe is a beautiful place and it will actually deliver often to us what it is we need if we will be open to doing new things and committing to them, but also to surrendering. Yeah, there's one other piece. And what you have, incidentally, I'm, just, I, I'm sure, it's called Netzach for persistence, right? You got to keep showing up. And one of my poems, I said, whatever happens, I'm just going to keep showing up. Okay, you have that. That's what my feeling is for you. You need that to make this work. You need that Netzach. You need that persistence. I'm just going to 
They keep going. I don't care. And then we get to the other side. Ah, we lost Dr. Cousins, but I'm quite sure that he will be back in just a minute as he reconnects. He's actually on the Russian River. You can see how gorgeous that was. And I think we heard ducks quacking too. So uh, while we wait for him, just remember that this family therapist, rabbi, yogi, spiritual mystic, vital at any age, mama mia, to look like that at 77, my goodness, and be able to do that many push-ups and pull-ups, I am really inspired. Humanitarian peace ambassador and physician of the soul. Uh, just to reiterate, you can find out more about him at Dr. Cousins, C-O-U, SENS.com, as well as treeoflife.mn.co. And again, the book of his, of the many, many books that uh, he has already put out into the world, um, the one we're talking about right now is his Can latest you... book, and that is yeah. called Into the Nothing, a Spiritual Autobiography. So it's fine, Dr. Cousins, I just... Um, I uh, gave them again your website and more information on you. And um, so thanks for popping back in with us. I knew you would. Oh, yeah, it's perfect timing. Uh, you know, <laughs> it was an hour, but somehow the computer went dead. But here we are on my cell phone. So uh, I just appreciate the good work you're doing. Hmm. You really get it. I, I could tell that deeply. And that's really, to me, that's really important because I, our work, I say our work, you and I were talking about, is how can we be the most powerful transformative force we can be on the planet to uplift the consciousness of all humanity. That's how I'm looking at it. And I'm going to just add that as far as I can tell, we are going into the Aquarian Age, December 21st. And for the West Coast, it's at 10 a.m., 10.20 a.m. And we're trying to get as many people to meditate for that transformation because it's about the expansion of consciousness for humanity. So I'll let you know about it. But I, again, really appreciate you are a fellow spiritual warrior. I love it. Oh, I am. I am. I resonate so much. Yeah. Thank you. Received. And, and I started out this conversation by... Uh, saying Manashtana Halayla Hazah. And so just, you know, if somebody doesn't speak Hebrew, it's something the youngest child, which I was, says all the time at Passover. And what it means in English is, why is tonight different than all other nights? So I just want to take that and say, with everything going on right now, Manashtana Halayla Hazah, why is this different? Why is this? What is your understanding of what's happening? And what is your understanding of how, Dr. Cousins, can we show up? We're talking about being spiritual warriors. I feel like now more than ever, right? Our souls chose to be here at this time. It's auspicious. We must be brave, very brave souls to choose this. God bless us all. So what can we know about, first of all, removing the fear of death and uncertainty and global fears? And then how would you say, peacefully can we show up today for ourselves and for humanity in the world? I know it's a huge question, but I would love you to weigh in on this. Sure. Um, the first thing is to have the intention to do that. Hmm. Without the general intention, it's hard. And then we need the persistence to do it. Okay. And why are we doing it? Because it's our time. So I, this is the way I feel about it. It is our time to uplift humanity. That's why we're talking about the Aquarian age. It's the human, uh, the water barrier, carrier, right? And, and water is consciousness. So it's something that's bigger than us. Yes. And the question is, as we look at the river out there, is how do we go with that flow of our destiny? the river of our life for all humanity and not just ourselves, but for ourselves, it is like, it is our time. This is the Aquarian age. This is, this is hardcore. And I'm going to say reality, but you have to be a little sensitive to tune in. And those people who are tuned in 
it's our, and I don't like to lay a responsibility trip on anyone, but it's if you're tuned in, it truly is our responsibility to be consciousness expanding agents to support everyone in this bigger picture. So that's how I see it. That way, do it in our different ways. You have your show, I'm doing my teaching, my book, Into the Nothing, is specifically about going along and aligning with the will of God. And the will of God at this point is, it's called wake up time for humanity. It's wonderful. It's, it's, it's like once every 26,000 years. I mean, it's that big. So that's how I see it. And we're just really lucky to be a little bit more t- tuned in as a change, uh, transformational of consciousness agents. And if God says it, you got to do it. If the door open, you got to walk through. That's how I look at it. So that's how I see it. I do it my way. I've got the books out. I uh, Every uh, six days a week, I'm doing the real teachings. I'm giving Shaktipat uh, six days a week around uh, California time, nine to about 9.30. I'm doing that like 10 minutes Shaktipat meditation and then 10 minutes of teaching. So it's all happening. It's our choice to go with the flow of the river. Mm. People who are interested in this and your meditations and connecting with you more, is it all on your website or where would you send them? They go to drcousins.com or treeoflife.mnmightynetworks.co. Everything is listed. Now I'm actually having a meditation retreat. Well, I don't want to, uh, once a month. Starts with Shabbat, Friday night, and then Saturday, Sunday, with three Shaktipat meditations a day. And then there's yoga. My wife's leading the yoga. We do different things. But it's a monthly thing. And twice a year, I'm doing uh, uh, spiritual fasting retreats at this point over the internet, which works. Actually, I was surprised it works. And then a special, what we call Yana Yoga, but it's Yoga of the Mind to help people learn how to dissolve their limiting beliefs about themselves. And Dr. Cousins, this is Dare to Dream. So what are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? (laughs) I can't wait to hear this because you have created so much. Well, the, the truth is in a subtle way, I'm committed to do whatever God tells me to do. So I try not to dream too much. My dream is to be totally aligned with God's will. Now, we are actually moving to Israel, okay? But I have programs in 26 nations around the world. And so I'm teaching all over the world. I've I've taught in 42 different nations. And if I could say my dream, which is my reality. Mm. My dreams are my reality, okay? We've got to kind of get that feeling for it. I expect that to continue to expand. I'm also writing my uh, next book called Spiritual Fasting. Okay, so it's not just fasting, it's spiritual. Like you're de- detoxing on a physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual levels. But I'm more into the humanitarian and awakening as many people spiritually as possible. So we have our humanitarian programs. We have... Uh, in a, well, I'm five nations in, in, in uh, Africa, uh, we're in Mexico, we're in Argentina, we're in Brazil, we're uh, all over North America, working with all the, many of the Native American tribes. We will continue to expand that to increase consciousness, but also call feed the people. It's very important to feed the people. So our farms, our organic vegan farms in all the five countries are actually feeding those people in the area where we're not our people are not starving because they're being fed okay because we're supporting that economically and so forth and then they'll get independent the farms get independent so i do diabetes prevention and also organic veganic farming around the world in the different nations and getting the word out and i uh my hope is to be able to reach uh millions of people in time with the expansion of consciousness. So that's kind of my dream or prayer, so to speak, uh, to to really 
be that uh, transformational force for millions of people because uh, it's it's our time to wake up. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on the show today and for all the amazing work you're doing on the planet. Yeah, and I want to bless you for all the good work you're doing. I love your program. I'm happy to come back at any time you want me, okay? Uh, but I bless you, and I really bless all the listeners mm -hmm. that they continue to be inspired by your work, by my work, that we really create a transformative uh, consciousness on the planet. Amen. It's our time. It's our time. Okay, Amen. Debbie. Thank you so much. And I'm going to end today's show with a quote, but I want to preface it by saying this. Something I find to be a beautiful synchronicity, which means no accident and divinely ordained, is that I choose a quote for every guest, having no idea before I'm going to use the quote on the show where my conversation is going to go. So I think you will see today is just like every other week over the many 13 to 14 years I've been doing this show, it is outstanding. So the quote I chose today is from Sogyal Rinpoche, and it is this, to be a spiritual warrior means to develop a special kind of courage, one that is innately intelligent, gentle, and fearless. Spiritual warriors can still be frightened, but even so they are courageous enough to taste suffering, to relate clearly to their fundamental fear, and to draw out without evasion the lessons from difficulties. I also support the blessing wow. that Dr. Cousins gave all of you. Thank you for supporting this show. Thank you for all of your beautiful comments. I read all of them and they're so meaningful and encouraging. And I ask you to subscribe to Dear to Dream so you can hear this number one weekly transformation conversation. And if you'd like to see us and you're listening on podcasts, go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. So you can also be inspired by the beautiful Dr. Cousins. My guest next week is renowned channel, Rebecca Dawson. She's been sharing wisdom from St. Germain, Kuthami, and Serapis Bay for over 20 years. She has much to share and you'll be the first on the front line to hear her wisdom for all of us. Don't just dare to dream. It truly is your time to create all your dreams into your reality.